Barnes & Noble Union Square, please give a warm welcome to number one New York Times bestselling author Clint Smith and our own Miwa Messer. I mean, he's the reason we're all here, right? I just want to say, so this is the third time I've read how the word is passed. And uh, there's always something new. And third time. So, hi, Clint. Hello. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you all so much for coming out. I really appreciate it. This is very cool. This is a really, really good start to 2023. So, Clint Smith, Dr. Clint Smith, he of the PhD, former teacher, poet, New York Times best-selling author. Clint was, I think, the third author we had on Poured Over when we brought the show out in June of 21. Before we get started, you also know that Clint is a staff writer for The Atlantic. And how many of you have seen Crash Course Black American History? Yeah, it's pretty cool, right? That is a really great tool. You have done some very, very cool things. Yeah, I'm glad. But before we get into all of that, how do we talk about what has happened to you in the 15 months since this book came out? I mean, the book pubbed in June of 21. Yeah. You couldn't really go on the road because lockdown. But this book has taken on a life of its own. Yeah. It's been unreal. Um, I mean, I, I was just... Um, telling folks that it's difficult to overstate how much um, this book has changed my own life, um, what it's meant to spend the last year or so back on the road and spending time with people who, uh, you know, teachers and uh, educators and uh, people who've spent time with this book, who've used this book as inspiration to go to the places in the, in the book or to go, you know, what's almost more, more joyful for me is using it as inspiration to revisit and re-examine their own communities. You know, people who've been like, I've used to pass, I read your book and I passed this cemetery, you know, every day my whole life and like I never stopped to see what was there. Or I, there was always this museum here and I never went or it allowed me to like look at this historical site that I've been mm -hmm. to with new eyes and, and that means so much um, because it, you know, I wrote this book hoping that it would take people on a journey with me. Like people right. ask about who the audience for the book is all the time. And I always say, and this is true, it's, it was a 15-year-old version of me. Um, I wanted to write the sort of book that I felt like I, I needed in my high school American history class. Right. And so I wrote this book not from a space of being an expert in this history. Mm -hmm. I wrote this book because I recognized after those statues came down in New Orleans in 2017, uh, statues of Robert E. Lee, P.G.D. Beauregard, Jefferson Davis, I recognized that I didn't understand the history of slavery in a way that was commensurate with the impact and legacy that it left on my city, on my state, on my country, on right. me as the descendant of, an ins of enslaved people. Um, and so I wanted to spend more time thinking about my, my personal rela relationship to this history in terms of lineage, um, thinking about the sort of larger macro relationship we all have to this history in terms of this country. Um, and I just feel lucky that what was a sort of personal excavation mm -hmm. and examination um, for me, it was something that people felt like they wanted to, to join me on. Yeah, and 15-year-old me, who grew up in Boston, needed this book, too. Mm. I mean, I was the way I was taught the Middle Passage was more about the molasses trade mm. than it was about trafficking human beings, right? Like, and I'm not that old. And I went to a really fancy school. And that's how I was taught in, you know, the cradle of liberty, all, you know, American Revolution. Yeah, so... Well, that's a little bit of perspective. And you start with Monticello, and we're going to come back to Monticello. I want to sit for a second in New Orleans, because that's where you're from. Yeah. You start this book in 2017, but there are two pieces of New Orleans that show up early in the book, the Whitney Plantation and Angola. Hmm. And I want to sort of set the stage for listeners here, and how far apart are they on the road from each other? So Whitney is about an hour and some change west of New Orleans, uh -huh. and then Angola's hour and 45 minutes 
northeast, um, sort of on the border of Louisiana and Mississippi. Part of why I want to start with those two places is this idea that you mention throughout the book. How do we tell the story of slavery in America? And it's all of our stories, right? This is an American story. This doesn't this belongs to all of us. We all have a responsibility to understand the story. But how do we get the story right? And the Whitney, if you've read the book, obviously the Whitney Plantation has taken a really terrific, interesting, smart way. And Angola, which I'm just going to point out again, is a federal penitentiary with a rodeo and a gift shop. And I'm still mad about the gift shop. I'm mad about the rodeo, but I'm really mad about the gift shop. That's just gross. And you're at Angola, and you're trying to get the tour guide to talk to you about Angola's legacy. And they're, what, 60 miles yeah. from Whitney. You know, I could have written an entire book um, probably about the experience at Angola prison. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. For context, for folks who might not be familiar, Angola is the largest maximum security prison in the country. 18,000 acres wide, bigger than the island of Manhattan. It's a place where 75% of the people held there are black men. Over 70% of them are serving life sentences, and it's built on top of a former plantation. And uh, I wrote a story for The Atlantic a few months ago uh, about an experience traveling to, to Germany and visiting. One of the places I visited in Germany was Dachau. I had this moment when I was standing in Dachau. It's this sort of haunting, vast expanse of gray land and you look to your left, it's the remnants of the crematorium. You look to mm -hmm. your right, it's the remnants of the barracks. And I just closed my eyes and did this thought exercise and tried to imagine like what it would be like if on that land they built a prison. And in that prison, the vast majority of the people held there were Jewish. Like I couldn't even fully finish the thought exercise because it, it was so viscerally upsetting. Mm -hmm. It was so abhorrent to imagine. We would mm -hmm. never allow a place like that to exist because it was so clearly run counter to all of our moral and ethical sensibilities. And yet here I was at Angola. Right. You know, the largest maximum security prison in the country where the vast majority of people are black men serving life sentences, mm -hmm. many of whom were sentenced as children because the United States is the only country in the world that sentences children to life without the possibility of parole, many of whom were sentenced by non-unanimous juries, mm -hmm. which has since been rendered unconstitutional by the Supreme Court of the United States for being a vestige of white supremacy, like an explicit vestige of white supremacy, who are working in fields, picking crops, mm -hmm. sometimes cotton, while someone watches over them on horseback with a gun over their shoulder. So part of it is examining like what are the specific manifestations of anti-blackness in the United States that allow that place to exist in that way, in a way we, nev we would never allow it to exist in a different geopolitical context. And to your point, like what does it mean that that place right. has a gift shop? Mm -hmm. And at the gift shop, you can go buy coffee mugs and shot glasses and baseball caps and uh, stuffed animals dressed in prison garb. And then on some of the baseball caps and on some of the t-shirts and the mugs, you have the silhouette of a watchtower. And above and below the watchtower reads Angola a gated community, right? As if to make a mockery of or belittle the experiences of the tens of thousands of people mm -hmm. who, who've been incarcerated there over generations. And I always remember this hot time I spent with Norris, who folks who right. read the book will know, you know, Norris was incarcerated in Angola for almost 30 years. Mm -hmm. And he's been out of prison for the last 20 years or so. And he's very much at the forefront of the um, leadership for the prison reform movement in Louisiana and really across the country. And he had this moment where we were leaving the uh, leaving the prison and Norris was looking out of the window and we saw these men who were working in the fields and they were lifting their garden hose into the air and digging them into the earth, lifting their spades into the air and digging them into the earth, lifting their shovels into the air and digging them into the earth. And Norris looked at the men and he looked at me and he looked at his hands and his hands had these calluses on them from all these years he spent working in the fields and he was like, Clint, I can't begin to explain to you what it felt like to work in fields, picking cotton, for seven cents an hour, wondering if my own ancestors had picked cotton in the same field 200 years ago, right? So for the people who were incarcerated in Angola, this history is not an abstraction. It's not a metaphor. It's not an intellectual exercise. It's in their bodies. Mm -hmm. It's in their bones. It's in the calluses in their hands. Um, and, and Angola is a place that represents what, you know, the scholar Studia Hartman would talk about is the afterlife of slavery, mm -hmm. the way that the remnants and residue of slavery continue to shape our social, political, and economic infrastructure, and most directly and most conspicuously, our carceral infrastructure in, uh, in really profound ways. And we have the Whitney Plantation in wild opposition yeah. to that, and this idea that we need to I don't even want to say relearn. We need to learn mm -hmm. 
for the first time what that means, because part of the Whitney Plantation's legacy isn't just the education that they're providing now for all of us, but the fact that so much of the community around mm. the plantation, this is interge intergenerational poverty. These are people whose parents, ancestors worked yeah. at the Whitney when it was a plantation. I mean, this is, and these are people who are living down the street from this place now. Perfectly well-intentioned. Mm -hmm. The Whitney does great work, but if you're living down the street from a place like that, mm. what does that education actually mean? You know, one of the interesting things about the Whitney is, is how it exists, sort of surrounded by constellations of plantations that whose, whose sort of sensibilities are deeply ahistorical, right? Like it's surrounded by these plantations where people hold weddings, where people hold parties, where you know, some of the slave cabins uh, at some of the plantations around the Whitney are used as bridal, the, the slave cabins at the plantations will be used as bridal suites for, for some of the weddings that people will hold there. And the Whitney is a place that exists, as you put it, like in opposition mm -hmm. to that sort of sensibility where it's like we can't understand a plantation as anything other than an intergenerational site of torture. And we don't often frame slavery in that way. We like don't frame plantations in that way, in part because of the success of the lost cause uh, propaganda effort, which is to say that like plantations were sites of torture. Mm -hmm. And like slavery was torture. And it's interesting because at the Whitney, part of what it does too is you're talking about the proximity it creates of the people who are the descendants right. of the folks who were incarcerated there. And so there's like a a human proximity mm -hmm. and intimacy. And there's also the sort of infrastructural proximity, mm -hmm. which because they have slave cabins that are there that were the original, some of the original slave cabins that were existing on that land at the time. And I always remember there was this one moment, like I always thought about slavery, I think prior to writing this book, primarily through the lens of like the, the spectacle of physical brutality, right? right? And because that's the way that we're taught about how horrible slavery was, we're like, you know, people are beaten and people are tortured and people are hung. And, and, you know, you think of the most famous scene in media around the brutality of slavery is probably the scene in Roots where, like, Kunta Kinte is being beaten yeah, yeah. and told to say that his name is Toby. And I think that that was the primary lens through which I understood how horrible slavery was. But it wasn't until I was at the Whitney. And as I was writing this book, my wife mm -hmm. and I, we were building our family. I now have a five and a three-year-old. And so when I was at Whitney, my kids were, were much younger. And there was this moment where we were standing in the cabin at Whitney. And I was there spending time with you know, people who were the descendants of those who were held here. Mm -hmm. um, and we were in this cabin. And you, know, you walk across the cabin, you hear the wood, the sort of cypress wood that's been cut mm -hmm. down from around the Mississippi. It's moaning under your feet as you walk. You see the lights shine in, sort of sneak in through the cracks in the roof. And you have this moment where you think about the people who 170 years ago were literally in mm -hmm. here, were enslaved in this space. And I hadn't thought about family separation right. as being one of the primary manifestations of the violence of slavery. Mm -hmm. But I, I did a similar thought exercise and I just kind of closed my eyes when I stood in this place. And I just tried to imagine what it would be like if I put my kids to bed one night and then I went to sleep and I woke up the next day and my children were gone. And I had no idea where they went. I had no idea who had taken them. I had no idea if mm -hmm. I would ever see them again. It's like a sort of, it's a, it's a emotional texture that's like unfathomable. Um, mm -hmm. And that feels so, like you don't even want to go near it to imagine the right. possibility of that. And then you have this moment where you realize, oh, this was the omnipresent threat right. that millions of enslaved people lived under every single day of their lives. That mm -hmm. at any moment, mm -hmm. you could be taken away from the person you're from your husband, from your wife, from your children, from your parents, from your siblings, for no reason at all. And the sort of, the psychological torture that that enacts on a person, that, mm -hmm. hang, that it hangs over a person, um, was like a reminder of the different manifestations of torture that exist right. on a plantation. Um, and, it's been, and being with people, and proximate to people whose own ancestors on that land, in possibly that cabin, experienced that sort of omnipresent threat um, just reminded me how recent this was, yeah. you know? And, and part of what the book is trying to excavate 
an outline is that this history that we tell ourselves was a long time ago. It, it just wasn't that long ago at all. You finished the research for this book in 2020. Yeah. We're sitting here in 2023, early in 2023. I mean, it's... Thomas Jefferson had a habit of selling enslaved people from Monticello, which, as we all know, is now basically a living museum. And he would do it whenever he was facing financial strain. And that included, frankly, selling his own children yeah. and his children's children. And the way we tell the story of Thomas Jefferson has obviously evolved over time. It went from, there was no Sally Hemings, what are you talking about, to she was the great love of his life. And I'm going to mention that she was, I think, 14, and he was in his 40s. So. And now it's, yes, of course, this happened, and she had a role, and two of their daughters left Monticello and could pass, and none of us know what happened to them. They've just disappeared into the world. Um, Monticello, though, and you open the book with Monticello, is trying to do something in a slightly different way. I mean, we're talking about a place where originally tour guides were dressed in livery, which I find completely horrifying, but then again, I'm not surprised. Mm. And yet, you meet a guy who's really actually trying to do the right thing, with the blessing of Monticello. Like, the institution yeah. itself is trying to change the story, and it seems to be helping. One of the reasons I wanted to go to Monticello was because I think that Jefferson sort of embodies the cognitive dissonance of the American project, which is to say that America is a place that has provided unparalleled, unimaginable opportunities for millions of people across generations in ways that their own ancestors could have never imagined. Mm -hmm. It has also done so at the direct expense of millions and millions of other people who have been intergenerationally subjugated and oppressed. Right. And both of those things are the story of America. It's not one over here and one over there. You get to pick that one and not this one. It's that they're both deeply entangled in one another. And I think Jefferson, similarly, again, sort of personifies that, that moral inconsistency where he's a person who wrote one of the most important documents in the history right. of the Western world and also enslaved over 600 people over right. the course of his lifetime, including four of his own children. He wrote in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal and wrote in notes on the state of Virginia that black people are inferior to whites in both endowments of body and mind, said the slave was incapable of love mm -hmm. in the same way their white counterparts were. The slave was incapable of pos uh, possessing or sustaining complex emotion. Wrote about Phyllis Wheatley, considered the sort of foremother of African-American mm -hmm. letters, said that her work was below the dignity of criticism, that it wasn't even worth engaging with because he didn't think that black people possessed the necessary intellectual or emotional acumen with which to create art. He was like, we can call this something else, but we can't call it poetry because black people don't possess the necessary intellectual and creative acumen with which to create beautiful things. And so when I went to Monticello, I was like, well, how is this place telling the story of this man? Mm -hmm. And like, are they telling the version of Jefferson that I learned when I was a kid? Right. That sort of lifted him up as this paragon of, of the American project and the sort of mm -hmm. intellectual founding father of this country, this person upon who no aspersion should be cast. Or are they telling a story that demands that we hold the contradictions and complexity of Jefferson alongside one another? Right. And are they telling the story of the hundreds of enslaved people who lived on this land and who for whom that land to my mind, belongs to as much, if not more, than it does to Jefferson. Right. Are they telling the story about those people in addition to Jefferson? And I think that Monticello is a place that represents that like historical sites are not and don't have to be static. Right. right? Like how Monticello tells the story of itself now is very different than how it told the story of itself 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. How it tells the story of itself in 2023 is different than how it tells the story of when I went in 2018. Right. right? And I think that it is a place, it's not, it's not to say that it's perfect, and I think that, but I think it's a place, to my mind, that represents the idea that y there's no threshold that a person or that an institution or historical site crosses where it's like, okay, we're good. Like, we figured right, out right, how right, to right. do the responsible, that it's like constant, ongoing reflection, reexamination, proactively thinking about, well, what are... What are we doing well? What can we be doing better? Who are the stakeholders? How can we broaden our conception about who is invested or should be uh, a part of the mm -hmm. decision-making process, right? And a lot of places have struggled with that. Most, right. no, most recently, um, Mount Pelier, right. you know, with the descendants of um, James Monroe uh, 
and it's you know wrestling with this idea um, that like who who is who are the people who get to tell the story? Who are the people who get to um, determine how we communicate the legacy of um, of this person and of this place? Which brings me to your past as a teacher. You taught high school. Do yep. I have that right? Okay, high so English. high school in. Are there teachers in the room? Yeah. Hey. Okay. I have a Look lot for you guys coming up in the next few minutes. Out on a school night. Uh, Look at you. Living dangerous. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Prince George's County, right? Yeah. Maryland? Okay. There are several questions, both from Eventbrite and from folks coming in tonight, though, asking how we teach this to kids without overwhelming them with the trauma? How do we get them to engage with a story that some of them might say, well, that wasn't my grandfather, that wasn't, how do yeah. I, because you know, we see these images in black and white and suddenly someone thinks, oh, that may as well have been 1602 when yeah. in fact it was 1975. I remember when I was a kid growing up in New Orleans and I was just inundated with messages about all the things that were wrong with black people. Uh, some of it was explicit, some of it was more subtle, but all of these messages about how black people were responsible for the violence and the poverty and the crime that they were experiencing in their community, um, and that it was black people's responsibility to figure out how to um, remove themselves and remove these phenomena from being sort of omnipresent parts of their community and disproportionately impacting uh, black folks. And I knew it was wrong, but I didn't have the language or the toolkit or the historical or sociological context with which to say it was wrong. And I remember, and what happens is that if you inundate a young person with a message and you just keep inundating with them with this idea about all the things that are wrong with them or the people who look like them or the people they love, and you don't give them the information with which to push back against it, the most logical but also most insidious endpoint is that they begin to internalize it. And, they, and I remember this feeling of like, I know this is wrong, but I don't know how to say it was wrong. But, and so I was sort of confused and there was a sort of intellectual and emotional paralysis um, that I didn't know how to articulate. And it wasn't until years later when I read these books and had access to these texts and these ideas and these scholars and writers and journalists and artists who provided me with language, who provided me with uh, information, who provided me with the historical nomenclature with which to understand that the reason one community looks one way and another community looks another way mm -hmm. is not because of the people in those communities, but it's because of what has been done to those communities, generation after generation mm -hmm. after generation, what's been taken from those communities. And I think of all this time about this uh, essay by James Baldwin, um, I was published in 1964, called A Talk to Teachers. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he says in it's based on a speech he gave to a group of New York City educators in 1963. Mm -hmm. And he's like, the role of the teacher is to help the black child understand that even though the world tells them they are criminal, the role of the teacher is to help that black child understand that it is the society and the history that created the conditions that that child is forced to grow up in that is the real criminal, not the child. And for many of us, that can feel intuitive but I think we can forget how it's not necessarily intuitive for so many of the young people um, that we spend time with. And so for me, I, I know what it feels like to not, to be told that the people you look like, the people you love, the place you come from is the problem. And to not have the tools to understand that, oh, these are the, res the reason there is the landscape of inequality exists in the way that it does is because of things that were done to or taken from this community and not because of the people themselves. Right. Um, and so I think you have to take seriously what it means to teach young people what this history is, what the history of slavery is, history of Jim Crow, history of mass criminalization. Mm -hmm. And you also need to communicate that that is not, that our experience as black people is not singularly determined by that, right? That you can do both and. You don't mm -hmm. have to, mm -hmm. you can communicate the seriousness, you can communicate with seriousness that you have to understand these phenomena because you have to understand that this is what created the society you live in, but you should be under no impression that this defines who you are um, or that this is um, an inevitable 
inevitably shaping the trajectory of your life. Mm -hmm. that, you can still, that you still do have agency. The world is a social construction and it can be reconstructed and deconstructed and made into something new. Um, and you know, I think about that with my kids all the time. You know, right. I think about, it's, and it's like you, you know, we have the book about, we have the books about Harriet Tubman and we have the books about Frederick Douglass and we have the books mm -hmm. about Martin Luther King and we have the books about the little girl who wants to grow up and be a robot and the little boy who wants to right. grow up and be a bottle of ketchup, right? Like you just, you, it's both. It's all right. of it. And you, you try your best to communicate it in a way that's developmentally appropriate, um, that's thoughtful, uh, but, but it is a conversation that, that has to happen and it's just a matter of figuring out what each young person needs um, and can, can sort of handle at any given stage mm -hmm. of their life. Rachel Torres, I think that answered your question. Yeah? Okay. It did, right? Okay. Just, just checking, but I thought it did. <laughs> I want to go back to the book for a second because there, we have multiple questions about your physical safety. And I know you and I have talked about this, and thankfully there is a dude called William who <laughs> backed you up at Blandford He's Cemetery. He's here. Where's oh, he at? William. Billy, raise your hand. Dude, hi. I'm so happy you exist. That's Billy from the book. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming, dude. Um, My wife was like, you can't go to the Confederate Cemetery unless Billy comes with you. Yeah, and your I was wife like, is right. She, I was like, Billy, I need you to come to this Confederate Cemetery with me to spend the day with the Sons of Confederate Veterans. He's like, cool, cool. I got a few questions, but I think we can do this. Um, nah, he held me down. Okay, and seriously, I'm really not kidding when I say I'm glad, because I was sweating reading that, I was not having a good time reading that chapter, because again, we're talking about your physical body in a space where, you know, if you intellectualize, okay, lots of us have intellectual understandings of slavery, what the word means, what it was supposed, like, intellectual. But we're talking about you physically standing in a space where you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. No offense, Billy doesn't look that tall. <laughs> I mean, I'm not that tall either, but I mean, I'm actually, I was saying to Clint earlier, I'm not wearing my Jordans tonight because I need a little height when I do these things. And we could have been shoe twins, but I oh, Could have been. Ah, time. The things that could have happened. Um, but Blandford Cemetery with its Tiffany windows yeah. and its picnics and its parades, it is a very important place for some of our fellow Americans. Yeah. And I'm still, I'm glad that you went. I'm still a little shocked that you did. Well, it's interesting because it's one of those places that is, it represents the idea that what you begin thinking the book will be is not always what the book becomes. Like mm -hmm. I didn't write in my book proposal that like I'm gonna go spend the day with the Sons of Confederate Veterans. I think both my wife and my literary agent would have been like, that's not a good idea, we're not gonna do that. Um, but I, well, it's interesting because I was gonna write a chapter on Civil War battlefields and I went to Petersburg, Virginia, uh, which was where the siege of Petersburg happened toward the end of the war and I was like gonna write about how the National Park Service is like communicating what happened in this, uh, this moment in the war. And I, spent, I went there and it was interesting and I was having some conversations with the National Park Ranger there. And I was telling him about my project and he was like, oh, you should go to this Confederate cemetery down the road. And it was this moment, it's like in the movies where there's the devil and the angel who appear on your shoulder. <laughs> and it's, except it's like regular Clint and writer Clint. And so like, <laughs> writer Clint is like, we have to go to the Confederate cemetery. Yeah, yeah. And regular Clint is like, we're absolutely not going to the Confederate <laughs> cemetery. That's not happening. Um, but what I love about these moments in this kind of book is that sometimes the story is telling you where it wants to go. Right. And so for me, it was like this, I gotta go. And so I went and it was so fascinating. And you can see in the book that like, you know, in my initial visit, it, there was such a conspicuous absence of discussion around mm -hmm. the thing mm -hmm. that was so conspicuously around us. Like it, it, it yeah. is, again, hard to overstate that this is a place in which there were like Confederate flags on like every gravestone the windows in the chapel all were dedicated like in writing on the windows to the Confederate dead. Um, and there was just nothing said about the Confederacy at all. And I went down to the visitor center and spent time in conversation with the director of the center. And I was, you know, we were talking about this, we were having a conversation and I was, I remember I saw this sort of, um, here, I'll use this. Mm -hmm. It was like this pile of, um, 
a flyers on the on the counter between us. We were having a conversation, and I wasn't really looking at it. And I looked down, and I was like, well, "What is that?" And it was the flyer for the Sons Confederate Veterans Ceremony. Mm-hmm. And she she saw me looking at it. And she was like, and she was like, I don't. She, and then threw it. I'm not gonna throw your stuff, but she was like, yeah. threw it in the air. And there are like these flurries of of paper. Yeah. She's like, I don't know what that is. I've never. <laughs> I've never seen, I don't, who are those people? Like, I don't know who they are. I'm like, ma'am, you run the site. Like, you, yeah. and so that was another moment where reg- regular Clint and Ryder Clint, right. regular Clint is like, don't do it, don't do it. And the, Ryder Clint is like, well, we're going to spend the day with the Sons of Confederate. Then I called Billy, and then it was game time. But that shameful response that she had, that was fascinating to me yeah. because you don't meet anyone else in that chapter who's at all ashamed of any of the choices mm. they've made or any of the things they say. And I am, um, you know, I showed you guys my dog eared, but I, I annotate a lot, a lot. I had a lot to say in that chapter. Yeah, actually, I do need some yeah. of those questions <laughs> my, back. My fault. <laughs> but, I was like, how dramatic do I want yeah, this rendering well, to be? Yeah. You know, we can get clever, yeah. but shame. You know, it seems like there are a lot of folks in a lot of different places who are not comfortable listening to facts that they may not have heard previously that make them uncomfortable. Shame is a really powerful thing. And shame, when in, in the, presented in the context of American history, right, in your response to the historical record, it's wild how people respond. Yeah. What Blanford taught me more than anything was that for so many people, history is not about primary source documents. Right. It's not about empirical evidence. It's a story they're told. Mm-hmm. And it's a story they tell. It's an heirloom that's passed down across generations. It's something where loyalty takes precedence over truth. I always remember the conversation I had with, uh, with Jeff at the Confederate Cemetery. Jeff is a um, Confederate, son of the Confederate veteran member, uh, has a long salt and pepper ponytail, handlebar mustache, round belly, biker vest with Confederate paraphernalia all over it. Uh, and he was telling me the story about how his uh, grandfather used to take him to the cemetery. They'd mm-hmm. sit in this beautiful white gazebo at the center of the cemetery. Mm-hmm. And his grandfather would sing the old Dixie anthem and would tell him stories about the men who were buried here and say that these men weren't fighting a war for, uh, over slavery. They weren't fighting a war over secession. This was a war for uh, safety. This was mm-hmm. a war for state sovereignty. This was mm-hmm. to protect themselves against, from the war, northern aggression. And he would tell the story, you know, and talk about how while he and his grandfather would sit there, they'd watch the sun set and watch the sky turn from blue to orange to purple to black, watch the fireflies emerge Mm -hmm. out of the forest, watch the deer come out of the forest and graze around the tombstones. These really sentimental memories. And now he talks about how he brings his granddaughters to that same cemetery and tells his granddaughters the same story that his grandfather told to him, sings the same songs with his granddaughters that his grandfather sang to him. And so if I'm gonna go to, to Jeff and be like, Jeff, like I know your granddad said secession had nothing to do with slavery and civil mm-hmm. war had nothing to do with slavery, but all you have to do is look at the declarations of Confederate secession where the states say it for themselves. You know, mm-hmm. 1861, Mississippi says, our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest in the world. Right. So they're not vague about why they're seceding from mm-hmm. the union. They're very clear about it. But the thing is, if Jeff is to accept that information, he has to accept that his grandfather is lying to him. And if he has to accept that his grandfather was lying to him, it threatens to disintegrate the foundation upon which his relationship with this person that he loves deeply is built. And this right. person who not only, who also represents like a larger f- family, a larger community, a larger mm-hmm. set of ideas that have played an enormous role in shaping who he is and who he understands he is mm-hmm. in relationship to the world. So it, for Jeff, it's not a question just of the stakes feel so high Mm -hmm. because it's not a question of just doing a historical reassessment or recalibrating your relationship to American Mm -hmm. history. It's like an existential crisis. It's like a crisis of identity. It's like, who am I if you're telling me that the stories that have shaped my identity aren't true anymore? And I think that we have to take seriously the human texture and the emotional texture that undergird so many harmful and bigoted beliefs, which isn't to excuse them, right. but to understand the forces, the deeply like emotional forces that are animating them. Because mm-hmm. uh, if we don't understand that, we render these folks sort of caricatures of bigotry in ways that, that do, don't fully take into account 
what is the catalyst to these views in the first place. And the flip side of Blanford actually is New York City, because we were the good guys, right? right? I love that line that you put in there. I really, that line is so, and I say that especially having grown up in New England, because <laughs> you guys know how we see ourselves. City on the hill, uh-huh. So, how many of you, I want to ask the audience, how many of you know the corner of Water and Wall Streets in New York? Yeah, you know it was there, right? 1711, first slave market in New York City. And it was there until 17, what? 1760 something, you said? 80 something? So, yeah. And you know, the African burial ground is just about 10, 15 blocks up. So, I mean, we're sitting on Union Square, right? Just, <laughs> we weren't always the good guys. And we love to tell ourselves stories. It's very easy to sit in the North and be like, well, that wasn't us. That wasn't us. Yeah, we have plenty of our own examples of stuff that we didn't do right. And I mean, you taught in Maryland. Maryland's got its own. There are moments when I'm in DC and I remember DC is a southern city. Yeah. I mean, in, in terms of New York, I mean, it's, you know, folks need to remember that New York was at one point the second largest slave market mm -hmm. in the country. Uh, the mayor of New York City, Fernando Wood, was so uh, adamant on the eve of the Civil War that New York City secede alongside the other states of the Union because mm -hmm. uh, the New York City's financial, political, social interests were so deeply entangled in the slaveocracy of the South. Um, that he was like, we should secede from the Union alongside the rest of these Southern states because this is gonna be, it's gonna be terrible for us right. um, if, if, uh, if slavery is rendered obsolete um, and saw Abraham Lincoln mm -hmm. and, and his policies as a, a sort of, again, of this existential threat. And Maryland, it's interesting, I've been thinking about it a lot because it's not a coincidence that, like Maryland is an interesting and complicated place mm -hmm. when it comes to slavery, but it's also not a coincidence that the two most famous enslaved people in American history are both from Maryland, right? right? So like Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, part of the reason we know who they are and this goes back to the you know what we were talking about earlier, the way that we teach about this history, yep. and the way that we um, how how complex are we rendering this history, and like are we are we giving it the sort of layers that are necessary? Which and what I mean by that is like when I was a kid, one of the things that me and my classmates would always say when we were taught about slavery, we were just like we would never let this happen to us. Mm -hmm. We were like why we would never they wouldn't keep me, so I would run away. And part of that is informed by the fact that the ma majority of the stories we hear from right. slavery are from folks like Harriet Tubman, from, from folks like Frederick Douglass, mm -hmm. who are folks who ran away. So until you're like, Harriet Tubman ran away, Frederick Douglass ran away, I would run away too. Why didn't everybody run away? And you don't understand the sort of multiple layers and the multiple, and the calculus and the cost. Right. So like Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass Part of the reason they're so well known is because they lived in a border state. And so when Frederick Douglass escaped, he got on a train and dressed as a sailor as a disguise and like went to New York City, which isn't to, to suggest that it wasn't courageous or brave or anything like that, but it's, it's fundamentally different than being in Louisiana or Alabama or Mississippi when you're sort of trying to wade through a swamp. And so what you know to be true is that if you are, if you have children, mm -hmm. if you read all the stories about people on the Underground Railroad and kids, if you try to escape with children, it's basically a death sentence, right? Like mm -hmm. you, children don't have the endurance, they don't have the stamina, they won't make it. And so you're like, okay, well, if I go with my kids, we'll all be caught, so maybe I won't go with my kids. And so then you have these people who are making decisions about, well, what is freedom if I can't share it with the people I love? Mm -hmm. Like what is, what is freedom if you can't share it with your wife or your kids? or your parents, like is that a freedom that I want or do I want to try to make the most of uh, some and create the most meaning of a life that I can here in this space of unfreedom? And so then you say, okay, well, let's say you, you've explored all those, that, that sort of calculus mm -hmm. and you're like, I'm still gonna go. You have to accept that even if you successfully make it to Ohio or New York or Canada, that the people you leave behind will be punished for what you've done. Right, so it's not only like, can I make it? It's not only, should I bring my family? It's not only, will I leave my family behind? It's like, even if you go and it is by all accounts a success and you get to Canada right. unscathed, somebody's going to be made to pay for what you did to teach a lesson to everybody else. Right. So are you gonna go escape if it means that the per people you love might be physically tortured 
for what you did. And I, and I say all that because I think it, when we teach slavery, we don't teach it always in the complexity that it deserves, mm -hmm. which allows young people or anybody who's thinking about this to have a, a sort of two dimensional and thus like a distorted sense of like what was happening and what was at play and what the physical and emotional stakes were. Um, and I think, you know, when you think about a place like New York City, you have to hold, in, in so many of these places, but New York City is another place you have to hold the both end in this Right. Because when people think of New York or they think of New England, they think of them as like bastions of the Underground Railroad. And if mm -hmm. you made it to New York, you were good. But there's all sorts of stories about people who made it to New York and like still lived in profound fear of it at any moment. They could be right. captured and caught and sold back into slavery. Or, you know, you have the famous story of um, in 12 Years a Slave with Solomon Northrop. He wasn't enslaved and he was caught and sold into slavery. And so, you know, even the, and that even beyond that, that New York, as we said, was like, had its own deeply invested relationship to slavery. And so part of what this book is just trying to do is, is demand that we hold the complexity of history together because sometimes I think we try to flatten it. Sometimes with the goal of making it accessible mm -hmm. to people, mm -hmm. but sometimes in an effort to make it accessible, you do a disservice to what the history actually was. Of all the sites, and this is, someone did not sign their index card. Uh, of all the sites you visited or wrote about, which was your favorite to write slash experience slash uncover? It's one of those things that like, it's like asking what your favorite child is um, or who your favorite child is. <laughs> and some parents will be like, depends on the day. Um, <laughs> but, uh, the thing I'm most grateful for is the way that it led me to have the conversations with my grandparents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is the epilogue of the book. Yep. You know, my granddad born in 1930, Jim Crow, Mississippi, and my grandmother born in 1939, Jim Crow, Florida. And I remember walking with them through the National Museum of African American History and Culture, pushing my grandfather in his wheelchair, this cane laid across his lap, my grandmother walking a few paces ahead of us, and just watching them watch this museum, like observing them, observe these exhibits, and having that moment of realization where like, you recognize that so much of the history of violence that's documented in this museum are things that my grandparents experienced firsthand. And then part of what that chapter did too, and, and those conversations did, was reinforce that sense of proximity, because the book started with an okay. effort to, to explore and excavate like our collective physical proximity to this mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, I think I got a better sense of our collective temporal proximity yeah. to that history. Because, you know, the woman who opened the National Museum of African American History and Culture in 2016, a woman named Ruth Bonner, she was the daughter of an enslaved person. Yeah. Not the granddaughter, not the great granddaughter. Mm -mm. The woman who opened the National Museum of African American History and Culture in 2016, who rang the bell alongside the Obama family, was the daughter of someone born into slavery, right? My grandfather's grandfather was enslaved. So when my five-year-old son sits on my grandfather's lap, I imagine my grandfather sitting on his grandfather's lap. And you're just reminded that this history that we tell ourselves was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. wasn't that long ago at all. I always, I bring this up because I think it's helpful context, but I went to England uh, a couple years ago and we were on tour at Oxford University. Mm -hmm. And we were walking around Oxford and the, uh, the tour guide was showing us all these different places. And he was like, this famous uh, poet wrote this poem in this building, and this famous scientist did this experiment in this building, and this famous philosopher wrote this treatise in this building. And he looked at this one building, and looked at the building, and looked at us, and looked at the building, and looked at us. And he was like, this building was built around 1020. And I'm like, AM or PM? Like, I couldn't even, <laughs> like, I couldn't even conceive of the idea that a building that was, like, people were walking in and out of had, built, had been built a millennium ago. Right. But I say it because it's a reminder that the U.S.'s history is so young. Yeah. Like, it's so recent yeah. relative to the rest of the world. We're just, like, the annoying preteen of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and it shows. And it shows. It shows. And mm -hmm. so when you talk about this history, you know, the history, slavery existed in this country for almost 250 years. Right. Or the British colonies that would become this country and that has only not existed for a little over 150. Right. So you have an institution that existed for almost a century longer than it hasn't, mm -hmm. in which there are people alive today who knew, who right. loved, who were raised by, people who were born into mm -hmm. slavery. And so the idea that anyone would suggest that this history has nothing to do with the contemporary landscape of inequality, that it is not continuing to shape our social, political, and economic infrastructure. I mean, it's, it's just morally and intellectually disingenuous. Right. And, and so I think that those conversations with my grandparents, 
and that time with them in the museum and thinking about their proximity to that history, how they were growing up in a moment where there were millions of people still alive who had been mm -hmm. born into slavery, um, just reminded me that, you know, in the scope of human history, I mean, that was just yesterday. Yeah, and we have a couple of different questions, which are basically the same question saying, is there anything you feel like you're missing from this book? Are there voices that are missing? Is there an experience that's missing? I think the book is what it was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, we cut a lot because I, another thing I took very seriously is like wanting the, the physical product of the book to feel accessible. Um, Cause like I'm someone, like I got a PhD, like I'm a writer as a profession. And sometimes, you know, I'll be walking around Barnes and Noble and then you see the book that's like a thousand pages long and you're like, uh, I don't know, man. Um, and it's, it can be intimidating. And those are some of my favorite books, but like I, because I was writing this for a 15 year old version of myself, I also know, like I didn't want a 15, 16 year old kid to look right. at the book and be like, and, and feel overwhelmed by the prospect of reading it. Yep. And so we cut a lot of stuff in a lot of places that otherwise would have been in the book to ensure that it was mm -hmm. under 300 pages. Um, if there was one place I wish I could have added, I mm -hmm. probably would have done a chapter on slavery in California. Mm -hmm. um, you could do a whole book on that, you know. You could. Uh, I say this is a part-time Angelina. My, uh, and maybe that's in the second version, because yeah. I had a friend who was like, if you do How the Word is Past Part 2, you got to call it Too Past, Too Furious. Um, I would so and I was like, I, I might do it that, for the I would read that in a heartbeat. <laughs> I would absolutely read that in a heartbeat. But you also have a 103-page poetry collection coming out in March, which I want to shout out. Um, this is a galley, so just know it's going to be in hardcover first, but it is coming. It is gorgeous. It is wonderful. We have a couple of folks who are wondering, though, what it's like to switch between writing very intense narrative nonfiction, very intense journalism, and really, really, really beautiful poetry. It's fun. Yeah, um, I can imagine. Yeah. No, I, I, feel, I feel very grateful to be able to move between genres. And a lot of this mm -hmm. book was written while I was writing How the Word is Passed. Um, I mean, it is a sort of chronicle of the last... You know, my son is five and a half. Um, and so it's like a chronicle of my wife becoming pregnant with our son um, to them now and just examining uh, what it is to have two young children and to watch them watch the world and to, to sort of rediscover wonder in a way and to, because you're watching these two little humans discover the world for the first time right. and it's, you know, I just, and the, one of the first things in the book is um, my son being like, have you ever really looked at a ladybug? <laughs> like, isn't it amazing? And then, you know, half the time I'm like, this ladybug's in the house, get it out the house. <laughs> um, and then he's like, wow, a ladybug. And I'm like with a newspaper in my hand chasing yeah, the ladybug. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I'm, I didn't kill the ladybug, everybody. I know some people are like, wow, that monster. He's like killing ladybugs in his house. Um, I gently use the newspaper to guide the ladybug out of the house. Um, but, but there's so many things that I like, that I, there's, I just feel a lot of gratitude yeah. because watching my kids watch the world has reminded me of how remarkable, mm -hmm. like in the midst of what would have been a very tumultuous, difficult, emotionally draining several years for so mm -hmm. many of us over, for so many reasons. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we, there are these interpersonal moments and these intimate moments with the people we love um, that remind us that amid everything, like how remarkable it is to be alive and like how remarkable it is to be a human. And I, and I think the sort of through line from how the word is passed to this is that like I think all the time about how first enslaved people who came to this country mm -hmm. or the British colonies that would become this country came in 1619. Slavery didn't end until 1865. But what's true is that from the moment enslaved people arrived on these shores, they were fighting for freedom. Right. They were fighting for liberation. They were fighting right. to be free. What that also means is that the vast majority of people who fought for freedom never got a chance to experience for, for themselves. But they fought for it anyway because they knew that someday someone would. Mm -hmm. I think about how my life, how my children's lives are only right. possible because of people who fought for something they knew they might never see, but who fought for it anyway because they knew that someday someone would. And I think about how so many of the moments I get to experience with mm -hmm. my children are only possible because of people 
who fought their entire lives to make it possible for, for like these people they would, knew they would never meet. Um, and so the book is sort of a wash in, in a gratitude both for my children, but also for the people that I'll never know who made right. all of our lives possible. Um, and thinking about, well, what sort of responsibility does that bestow upon me to sort of attempt to build the sort of world that I might never see, that my children might never see, that their children might never see, um, but that what was done for us was that people fought to build the sort of world they knew that we deserved to live in. And, and I think that that's what we have to do also. And I really want to end there, but I'm not the only person who wants to know if there's a young reader edition coming of how the word is passed. I've gotten that question a lot. It's just um, a thought. It's, I you mean, know, the people are asking. We'll never say never. Um, we, I don't know. I don't know. It's, um, I'm, I'm really moved that there are so many teachers who, you know, ask for a young adult version or a middle grade version. Right. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. Uh, listen, it's fair enough. You've got the poetry coming out. You're a staff writer at The Atlantic. I mean, there's a lot going on. You sit on a stage with me for an hour, which, lucky us. But I suppose we should let you do the book signing part of things. So. Let's do it. Clint Smith, thank you so much. Thank you. How the word is passed. Thank all of you for coming out. But, but, all. but, okay. Thank you all. Okay, you guys are amazing, but there's a tiny bit of housekeeping because there's a lot of you and only so do me a favor.